been on the Bible bus as we've journeyed through Philippians, you'll be glad to know that today we continue our study on the source of our power for Christian living, joy. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you as we begin our study of the popular verses found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. But before we begin, I got a quick letter to share from Jeff in Indiana. Thank you for your ministry and for allowing us to become partners. We have listened on Radio WBRI and through your app for at least 10 years. For a while, I searched for a solid Christian radio program that I could listen to while eating lunch at work. That's when I found Dr. McGee's teaching on Daniel. With Dr. McGee's guidance, I've been able to answer many difficult theological questions my children have had, and this spurred our family into a significant commitment to the Great Commission. This year, my wife and I decided to become partners in prayer and in giving. What a blessing this has been. As a family, we read the Bible every day and have done so for the past five years. Our spiritual growth this year has been amazing, and we have decided to support ministry and missionaries who focus on getting out the Word of God. Thank you for your steadfastness and dedication. We pray every day with the World Prayer Team and find great encouragement as we hear from our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Well, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for your prayers as well as your financial support. It's a pleasure to have you and your family aboard the Bible bus with us. You know, it's only through the faithful support of friends like you and Jeff that this ministry continues to share God's Word in more than 120 languages and dialects all around the world. So if you'd like to join us in supporting this ministry through these prayers and gifts, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or just visit ttb.org forward slash give. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that your word will transform every heart that listens, no matter where we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, if you have found your place, friends, at Philippians 4.4, 4, we shall begin today. We're in the last chapter of this very wonderful epistle that has a great emphasis on Christian living. We saw in chapter 1 the philosophy, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then the pattern for Christian living, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Then the prize for Christian living in chapter 3, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And you've noticed that the Lord Jesus is the very center and circumference. He is the very heart and the periphery of Christian living. Now, here in chapter 4, we see the power of Christian living, and that is highlighted when we get to verse 13. I can do all things in Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, we were down to verse 4. And in this first section, we have the source of power. First four verses. Then we'll see the secret of power. Then we see the sanctuary of power, verses 8 and 9. And then from verse 10 through the remainder of this chapter, the satisfaction of power. Now, we want to come here now to the fourth verse, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now, joy is the very source of power in Christian living. Rejoice in the Lord always. That means always. That means that regardless of the day, whether it's dark or bright, whether it's difficult or easy, whether we're facing problems and temptations, or whether we are sailing through the sky on cloud nine, whatever cloud it is, that is the 
thing that we're told and commanded, and this is a commandment now for believers, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, he repeats it in case we missed it, rejoice, rejoice. That is something you and I can't work up from beneath. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. That's the second thing. Now, there is no power in a Christian's life except through joy. A sad Christian has no power. And one that does not experience the joy of the Lord has no power at all. Notice what Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 8.10. This is a tremendous passage, by the way. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's your power. You see, these people, many of them that had been in the Babylonian captivity, had never heard the Word of God. Never. They were as much in the darkness as any pagan or heathen would be today. And now, for the first time, they've heard the Word of God. They've heard it read. They've heard it explained. And it has been a thrill to their hearts. And they weep because of it. Now, Nehemiah said, wait a minute. You're not to weep. Today is a day, a great day. You're to share the blessings, the physical blessings that God has given to you, and you're to enjoy it. God wants you to. He's given us richly all things to enjoy. And to enjoy means rejoice. And that's your strength. That's your power. You can't be a Christian with power without joy in your life. That's what gets up the steam. That's the sowers of it. And let me illustrate that, because this is something that the world has taken over. In fact, they've made it rather hypocritical. Today, you find that salesmen that want to sell something, they're generally very happy fellows. You never went in to buy anything at a store and have the salesperson begin to weep on your shoulder. When you ask about a certain product, why, they begin to smile and tell you how wonderful it is. That's the way they do. Well, how far would the full of brush man get if he was a sad little fella that went around weeping at every door? He doesn't use that approach. He's a very happy fella. We had one several years ago, and I say we had one because my wife, somehow or another, thinks those brushes are a little bit better than the ones I can buy at the five and ten cent store. So she does business with it. And one Saturday morning, I was up in my study, which is the garage is connected to the house, and I have a room up there that's my study. And I was looking out the window down the driveway, and here comes the full of brush man. He wasn't crying, I can assure you. He had no crying towel at all, just smiling. And I wasn't smiling because my wife had gone to the market, and I knew that fella, you know, would distract me and take part of my time, and Saturday morning is when I got my sermon into shape. And so he rang the doorbell. I absolutely ignored him, that is, at first. And he didn't let up. He's not going to give up that easy. He put his thumb down on that door bell, and he stayed with it. And I saw immediately I was going to have to go down. So I went down, I opened the door, and I suppose with a scowl, I said, yes? You think that that in any way chilled him? By my friend, he was just absolutely the epitome of happiness. I've never seen anybody so radiant as the fellow was. He's selling brushes. And he said to me, imagine Dr. McGee seeing you. I never expected this privilege. Well, he knew immediately there's no privilege. I wouldn't buy a brush. And I don't know how he did it. But in the next two minutes, I found 
him in the living room, and I was talking to him, and I was holding in my hand a little brush he'd given me. Well, you don't put a man out of your living room that's just giving you a brush. So I had to listen to the sales pitch, and he gave it with great happiness. And then I told him that I was sorry that I didn't buy the brushes. My wife bought them. She was at the market, and that I was very busy. Well, that did not deter him. That did not pour cold water on him. Why, he said, that's all right, Dr. McGee, and I want to give his brush. Why, no, he said, that's yours. And he went out and went down the sidewalk whistling. And I thought as he went down, my, that man makes a living selling brushes. And that's the way he does it. And I could only wish that tomorrow morning at church, the members would come in like that fellow is. Now, I do not know whether he was really that happy or not. That is his sales approach, I'm sure. But a child of God ought to have it in reality. And there'd be power in our lives if we had a little bit more joy in our lives. fact of the matter is, the world tries to even work that up. In fact, they spend a great deal of money trying to produce joy. And they call it happiness. And they are after that. I tell you, the millions of dollars are spent in nightclubs. These comedians are living like millionaires because that's what they are today. All they do is tell a few stories. And people are shelling out money. Why? They want to laugh. They want a little happiness as they go through this life. And the child of God that goes through today life with a sour look and a jaundiced approach to this world, he'll never have any power in his life. Rejoice in the Lord all the way and again, I say rejoice. Now the world today tries to work it up another way. I have noted in going around to these motels that they all have bars, very few exceptions and that they also have what they call the happy hour. Well, I've watched folk who go in there, and none of them look happy when they go in, and I give you my word, in an hour or two hours when they come out, I can't see there's been any improvement. But they've had a happy hour. They feel like if they drink enough of the stuff, why, it will help them overcome the problems of life and give them a little happiness. And a great many people are trying to compensate for the inadequacies in their own lives in that manner. And I saw something new. It was new to me. We were up in Medford, Oregon, and at the Holiday Inn. And I came back, told my wife, I said, they don't call it happy hour here. They call it the attitude adjustment hour. Now, that is quite new, and I would very frankly recommend that churches have an attitude adjustment hour. And it would be very helpful, by the way. Every Sunday morning, here comes Mrs. Brown, and she's got a lot of things to tell. She's heard some choice gossip during the week, and she can't wait to spread it at the church. Well, it'd be wonderful if you could take Miss Brown into a very attractive room and give her a cup of coffee and get her in a sweet mood and make her shame to go around and tell those terrible things about some church members. Now, maybe the past even. I don't know. She might be talking about him. And then here comes Deacon Jones. And I want to tell you, he's breathing out fire like a dragon of the Middle Ages because things just don't go to suit him. And it'd be nice to take him in and, you know, to cool him off and help him recover his cool so he could go in and enjoy the sermon. May I say to you, we need an attitude adjustment hour, a happy hour in the church. And frankly, the devil sure has got in his licks. He's made folk believe today you can't have fun going to church. And I think you can. I think you ought to. I think it ought to be a joyful place. And that is the place of power I've heard in times past that the prayer meeting is called the hour of power. Well, that's nice, but we need a little something else. We need to get back to the source, and the source of power is joy 
And instead of praying in the prayer meeting for things and for God to do something, why not pray that he give us joy in our lives? There's a song I used to sing at the summer Bible schools when I was a young preacher and conducted them. Down in the dumps I'll never go. That's where the devil keeps me low. Now, that is a song that has a real theological message. That's exactly what he wants to do, is to take away the joy in your life, because that is the source of power. Now we come to the secret of power in verses 5 through 7. First, he says, "...let your moderation be known unto all men." Matthew Arnold translated that sweet reasonableness. I like that. "...let your sweet reasonableness..." Be known unto all men that you are a reasonable believer, that you are not a bigot in your faith. I think we ought to have deep convictions. I believe in that. But we ought not to be given to bigotry or riding a hobby, always emphasizing some little point. What we need is to emphasize a big point, because we have one. And that big point is the person of Christ. And if you're going to ride a hobby, let him be the hobby, by the way. Let your sweet reasonableness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, Paul believed that the Lord Jesus would come at any moment. And Paul wasn't looking for a great tribulation to enter at all. He says, yeah, the Lord's at hand. And that's quite wonderful. Now, he says here in verse 6, "...be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God." Now, he says here, "...be careful for nothing." And there are those that have translated that, "...be anxious for nothing," or "...be not overly anxious." The fact of the matter is, I think that Paul is making a play here upon two indefinite pronouns. Now, Paul used this type of reasoning and this type of logic, and he's putting over one against the other these two indefinite pronouns, and I think the emphasis is upon them, nothing and everything. He says here, and if I may give you the translation that we call here in Southern California, the Magius ad absurdum translation, it goes like this. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Now, prayer is the secret of power. Now, to worry about nothing. Now, we had a while ago a commandment. This is one of the new commandments he's given us. Rejoice. That's one. Now, worry about nothing. Pray about everything. That is the thing that he's saying here. Now, nothing is a very interesting word. Nothing is, it's nothing. (laughs) If you have something, it's not nothing. Now, that's not good grammar, but it sure is accurate. Nothing. Nothing is nothing. And you're to worry about nothing. Now, does that mean that we're to look at life with rose-colored glasses and that we are not to face reality, that... Sin is not real, sickness is not real, problems are not real, and we're to ignore them. Is that what he means? No, Paul, when he says worry about nothing, it's because we're to pray about everything. Now, nothing is the most exclusive word in the English language. It, believe me, leaves out everything. Worry about nothing. That means nothing. I don't know about you, but This is a commandment I'm afraid I break. I worry. Worry about nothing, but pray about everything. And the reason that we're to worry about nothing is because we're to pray about everything. Now, that means that everything that's in a Christian's life, he ought to talk to the Lord about it. I do not think that there is anything in the Christian's life that should be left out. We should absolutely... We should pray about everything. Someone came years ago, so I was told, to the late Dr. G. Camel Morgan. And this dear lady said to him, Dr. Morgan, 
Do you think we ought to pray about the little things in our lives? And Dr. Morgan, in his characteristic British manner, he said to this lady, Madam, can you mention anything in your life that's big to God? You see, when you and I say that we're going to take our big problems to God, what do you mean big problems? It's all little stuff to him. What we call little, he wants us to bring it to him. And what we call big, he says, bring it to him. Pray about everything. Take it all. And I believe that a Christian ought to get in the habit of talking to God and bringing everything to him in prayer, nothing excluded. I have attempted this on several trips I've made by car that involves several hours driving of just inviting the Lord Jesus to go along with me. And I talked to him. I just talked to him. I tell him about Vernon McGee. I tell him things about Vernon McGee I wouldn't tell you. And I tell him everything. And I think that we ought to learn to do that. We ought to pray about everything. I think today that I'm going to conclude by sharing with you something written by Fenelon, one of the mystics of the Middle Ages. And I think this characterizes and is the thing that Paul means here when he says, pray about everything. And I'm quoting now, tell God all that is in your heart. As one unloads one's heart, its pleasures and its pains to a dear friend, Tell him your troubles, that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys, that he may sober them. Tell him your longings, that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes, that he may help you to conquer them. Talk to him of your temptations, that he may shield you from them. Show him the wounds of your heart, that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved taste for evil, your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insincere, how pride disguises you to yourself as to others. If you thus pour out all your weaknesses, needs, troubles, there'll be no lack of what to say. You'll never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. People who have no secrets from each other never want subjects of conversation, They do not weigh their words, for there is nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of the heart, without consideration, just what they think. Blessed are they who attain to such familiar, unreserved intercourse with God. I carry that little clipping in my Bible and have carried it for years. Every now and then I take it out and read it. I think it's good to tell him everything. Why are we not to worry? Because we are to pray about everything. We are to face our problems. We are to recognize them, but we're to take them to God in prayer. These things, everything in a Christian's life is to be made a matter of prayer. Now, here is something else that is coming up. and We won't be able to develop it today, but we will next time. And this is really something that looks like a contradiction. It is a paradox, I'll grant. He says here to worry about nothing, pray about everything, that is, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And do you know what Paul is saying here? Paul says you are to thank God when you make a request of him for answering your prayer, because he'll answer it. Now, somebody's going to say to me today, Preacher, you just well stop. And I am right now in a second. But you just well stop because I've got unanswered prayers. I don't believe you have unanswered prayers if you're a child of God. I believe that God hears and answers all the prayers of his children. We're going to see what we mean by that next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. If you have a sick relative, are praying for the salvation of someone you love, or are even waiting for the doors of employment to open, 
You need to be reminded of this truth, that God hears and answers our prayers. Why don't you come back tomorrow when Dr. McGee's study will explain more about this bold statement. Come back to hear more about the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And then I'd also like to suggest visiting ttb.org and downloading Dr. McGee's free e-booklet from Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, titled, How to Have Peace in Anxious Times. It's just one of the many resources that we offer to help you deepen your own study of God's Word, and then to remind you that God never leaves His people without recourse and rescue in difficult times. Again, that address is ttb.org, or just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help direct your search. Our journey through God's entire Word continues tomorrow. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you right back here. Jesus made it home, home to be my home. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God to take the whole Word to the whole world.